In the headlines, President says Guyana will be the colossal of the Caribbean as he courts investments from Latin America and the Caribbean. Robert Vidal says no need for him to continue in politics if the PVP lives up to its promises. The Home Affairs Minister urges police to ensure lockups are clean and prisoners are treated professionally. The Hindu Dharmic Sabha urges those observing Navratri to adhere to COVID-19 guidelines. And in sport, we discuss the West Indies' possible test squad to New Zealand and Chris Gale among the runs in first IPL game this season. With the news, I'm Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for joining us. We started by telling you that the Police, Army and the Mines Commission this week unearthed a massive tunnel mining operation in the New River Basin some 50 miles east of Massacanary, or Guns Village in the South Rupununi. The New River Basin is designated a rare earth mineral reserve and as such, mining is strictly prohibited in the area. The Army in a release said that a joint team located the camp and discovered th three tunnels, one of which was abandoned while the remainder were deemed active. The team also discovered several pieces of equipment, including a satellite dish. No one was found at the camp. Due to the remoteness of the location, seizures of the equipment was not feasible, so they were subsequently destroyed. Investigators believe that the persons who were conducting mining operations may have been utilizing an illegal airstrip in Brazil, located some two miles south of the Guyana-Brazil border. Now, President Ifanali on Thursday pitched Guyana as the next investment colossal of the Caribbean as he tried to stir enthusiasm for investments in all sectors in Guyana. The president delivered the keynote address to the forecast on Latin America and the Caribbean conference hosted by the Association of American Chambers of Commerce and Latin America and the Caribbean. My primary task today is to have a conversation with you in order to convince you as to why you should be setting your sights on investment opportunities in Guyana. Guyana is about to become the investment colossus of the Caribbean. It will become the region's most exciting investment destination. Now, therefore, is the right time to be doing business in Guyana. Despite the economic problems caused by the coronavirus pandemic, our country's prospects have never been brighter or more promising. I wish to highlight three principal reasons why Guyana is a prime investment destination. Firstly, the country is about to leapfrog its growth and development. This will spawn untold investment opportunities. Secondly, its location and trade and investors agreement facilitate access to key markets. Investing in Guyana, therefore, carries market access advantages. Thirdly, the country has an attractive investment regime, which is being further refashioned to become more investor friendly. Guyana is now an oil producing country. This is our first year of production. Oil production is projected to continue well beyond the next 30 years. Upstream and downstream investments and the jobs and revenues which these will generate will catapult our economy to a higher level. This year, Guyana's economy is expected to grow by almost 50% on account mainly of the startup of oil production. The International Monetary Fund estimates that the average annual real GDP growth over the next four years will be in excess of 13%. Guyana, however, is not hitching all its wagons on oil. Guyana is rich also in timber, gold, diamonds, bauxite, manganese, sugar, tourism. Its agricultural potential is phenomenal. It is believed to possess rare and precious minerals and other potential bonanza. More than 80% of Guyana is covered with forests. These forests provide environmental services to the world. As we argued before, these forests are worth more standing than being felled. Guyana, therefore, is not hedging its future only on oil. It is reviving the traditional economic sectors in order to ensure a more diversified and resilient economy and to avoid both the resource curse and Dutch disease. Months after running as a political rival to both the governing and opposition parties, Robert Badal is now prepared to take a back seat in politics as he observes the work of the new government. He said he's already impressed with the focus of the People's Progressive Party government. Kurt Campbell reports.
Declaring that he's not a politician and only identifies as a businessman, Robert Badal says his future in politics will depend on what confronts the group of young politicians he leads under the Change Guyana political party. Badal, the owner of the Pegasus Hotel, had started and led the Change Guyana party into the March 2, 2020 elections, but just two months after the People's Progressive Party took up the reins of government, Badal now says he's comfortable to announce that he's taking a back seat in politics. Badal explained that his short stint in politics as a presidential candidate was geared towards challenging what he said was a failure of leadership by successive governments. That failure, he opined, has caused the country to remain poor while others move swiftly forward, something Badal, a former supporter of the previous AP and UAFC coalition, said he had to do something about. Um, I believe that once I see that, you know, what I think this country could become and the plans and programs and the strategies that are being implemented are consistent with growth in, of a, our economy, accelerated economic development and improvement in the standard of living of Guyanese. Once I see that our people just don't graduate in our schools and university and leave our shores that they find hope of a future right within our shores. Once we have um, our economic and social policies that support career development and building of a family and life in Guyana, and that Guyana uh, take its rightful place among progressive countries, so long as I see um, inclusive governance, there is no role for me in politics once I see that. You know, because that was the reason why I got into it in any way. The businessman said there is some cause for optimism since the swearing-in of President Irfan Ali. He singled out the pace at which the budget was presented, describing it as admirable. Badal, who has already engaged the president and vice president, Bar Chakdio, said he's impressed with the swiftness by which the telecommunications sector was liberalized, worked towards the new Demerara River crossing and the government's housing development. The, what I'm seeing there, I'm hopeful that the very, um, the, 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 the very policies that I had changed Guyana and myself had, Art Nigel and all of us had, had artic have articulated during that period, that short stint uh, as um, during the election period, we are seeing that's coming to pass. So I have to compliment the government for the action so far and the urgency with which they have done so, those are significant, and it gives the private sector, I believe, a, a lot of more optimism when you compare the period before elections and now those very important measures that have been put in place. I think, um, I feel, number one, optimistic and hopeful, and I think it will bring about a lot of economic benefits to this country. But while Badal may be impressed now, he says he stands ready to challenge any government that does not work in the interests of the Guyanese people. Badal's Change Guyana Party secured 1,955 votes countrywide and a single seat in the Region 4 Regional Democratic Council. He said it is still early days to decide now whether the party will participate in local government elections or even the next general elections. Kurt Campbell. Newsroom. When the newsroom returns, even with a backlog of 60,000 applications, hundreds more pour in. Stay tuned. This is the newsroom. The Minister of Home Affairs, Robson Ben, has urged police to ensure lockups are kept clean and fit for holding persons while their cases are being investigated. Opening the lockups at the Brigdam Police Station on Wednesday, Ben said he doesn't want to visit stations across the country and find dirty stations with dirty mattresses in the lockups. The Police Commissioner, Nigel Hoppy, said that the police force has been constantly reviewing its operations to ensure compliance with human rights standards. In an environment where the focus on the protection of human rights has never been greater, and justifiably so, and the world where the value of human life 
is increasingly being appreciated. It behoves the Ghana Police Force to constantly review its operation to the benefit of all. That the force serves as a mere custodian of offenders while investigations are ongoing or they are awaiting appearance at court where the innocent or guilt will be determined by the presiding either magistrate or judge. It has an implicit responsibility to treat every suspect as innocent until proven guilty, which means that the procedures employed and the holding facility used must be in compliance with the required standards. In consideration of these factors, as others, the Guyana Police Force has over the last decade and before been constantly reviewing and revising its strategies and operations so as to deliver its mandate. Today, thanks to the government of Guyana, the force with the newly constructed lockups will be planting yet another foot in the right direction as we seek to make our country safer and discharge our duties with a level of responsibility expected of any law enforcement agency deemed credible in the 21st century. Honorable Minister, I as Commissioner of Police Acting wish to say thank you and a special thank you because I know you've been always engaging us to ensure that this facility become operable. And, wish to, and, wish, and would wish to state that mechanisms will be established for care and maintenance of this and all other facilities in keeping with our strategic direction. We had noted that the lockups were um, not commissioned and that there had to be some adjustments made to operationalize them. And we thought that this was an urgent matter. Commissioner Hoppy spoke to our duty of care in respect of prisoners while they are yet to be examined by the courts. I want to pay particular attention, as he also informed, to the humanistic approach which we have to adopt in respect of our charges, these people, and that we should not have or continue to have situations where we offer these people and in so doing, even creating ourselves for ourselves a brutalizing experience for prisoners and that we demean our vow with respect to service and protection to the Guyanese public as we are policemen and people in the security sector. I'm particularly concerned about it because the quality of service of the police force and all other discipline service agencies is defined not how well you dress yourself, but in engaging the public and engaging the clients is a level of respect that we offer them, even while they may have troubles when they come to us, that we have to offer a high level of professional service and respect. And so we have to recommit ourselves always to the issue of service and protection to the public and to our country. So I don't want to expect any more to go to police stations and find them dirty, to find the mattresses on the floor dirty, to find the accommodations not properly kept. I understand there are barrack room personnel or people who are supposed to help with respect to this. Even as the Ministry of Housing and Water is faced with a backlog of over 60,000 applications for house lots, Minister Colin Cole revealed that for the months of August and September, over 800 new applications were received. The Minister assured that the government is working to fast-track infrastructural development for new housing areas before granting house lots to eligible applicants. When we gave the figure of active applicants of six to 7,000 plus, 
That figure I'm using is as to when we took over. And as I speak, the staff, they are also sanitizing the list, calling up persons to ensure that they're still there, still active. Um, in terms of new applicants, we have been receiving new applicants by the hundreds. A lot of persons now, sometimes they say, Minister, I would like to have a house lot. Did you apply? The simple answer was no. So they, they're much more aware that they, not, they need to be in the system before you're eligible for even being an, um, given pro or provided through the state machinery. Of course, in our allocation, we are targeting the arrears, and that is why our commitment of over 50,000, and now I'm even more assured that we will pass that target be within this first term. In addition to the areas that we have under our purview, the Guyana Lands and Survey Commission, as well as Gaisuko, um, well, Gaisuko and Nissel, they go hand in hand. Um, we have been engaging them. As I speak, Lansons, last Friday we met with Lansons Survey Commission and Nissel, the with Gaisuko, they are examining their, what they have on their database, all with the aim of making even more lands available for us for housing program. But I can assure every single citizen and every single eligible applicant that we will be able to service their needs and their request for housing development. For us too, I want to re-emphasize because it is very easy to us to start giving allocation letters. But one of the things that we're going through now is to ensure that we put the infrastructure in place for development of new areas. As the Hindu community prepares to observe the auspicious period of Navratri, which commences on Saturday, October 17, 2020, the Guyana Hindu Dharmic Sabha is advising all mandirs and devotees to adhere strictly to the COVID-19 prevention guidelines. The Sabha said it is deeply concerned about the escalating number of positive cases across the country. For mandirs planning to open for satsang, the Sabha said persons entering the mandir must wear masks at all times and, uh, and there should be hand washing facilities or sanitizers available. Individuals and families should remain six feet apart. The Sabha said too that bojan should be boxed and shared and worshippers should avoid congregating and eating on the premises. In addition, the Sabha urged that occupancy should be limited to not more than 25% of the mandir capacity and elderly persons and those suffering from chronic illness and immunosuppression states should observe the period at home. The Sabha said mandirs can consider remaining open for longer periods each day to allow individual worship in a phased manner. The Sabha has encouraged Hindus to pray and fast at home and pandits are encouraged to conduct online or virtual satsang. The Guyana Hindu Dharmic Sabha will be bringing the mandir to homes through chants, bhajans, kirtan and online satsang on its Facebook page throughout the period. When the news returns, success squatters refuse to move even after the lands they are on was flooded. Stay tuned. This is the newsroom. 60-year-old Alan Sim was on Thursday sentenced to 60 years imprisonment with the possibility of parole after serving 40 years for the murder of 31-year-old Melissa Skeet, a former dispatcher of the Georgetown Public Hospital whose bloodied body was found with several stab wounds in 2015. Sim, also known as Kayan, formerly of Paradise Housing Scheme on the east coast of Demerara, was sentenced by Justice Navindra Singh at the Demerara High Court where a 12-member jury found him guilty of murdering Skeet on November 23, 2015. Justice Singh described Sim as being, quote-unquote, very cold-blooded since he showed no remorse over the crime. It is alleged that in a day in question, Sim picked up Skeet from, uh, from work in his car. She was allegedly stabbed and tossed from the car in the vicinity of Carmichael Street in Georgetown by Sim, who was her common law partner, with whom she shared two of her four children. The woman, who had been bleeding profusely, later succumbed to the injuries she sustained. Sim was arrested and reportedly confessed to the crime on the caution. His car was four days later found with the passenger seat replaced. Sim was represented by attorney at law Adrian Thompson, while the state was represented by prosecutor Tuana Hardy. Hundreds of squatters living at success in the east coast of Demerara are now on the flood water after the Guyana Sugar Corporation, Gaisuko, began flooding the lands on Wednesday. But the squatters say they will continue to occupy the lands and are calling on the government to come out and speak with them. When a newsroom visited the area on Thursday, the squatters breathed a sigh of relief after the pump being used to flood the lands began experiencing some mechanical problems, causing the water to recede a little. 
The Guyana Sugar Corporation, Gaisuku, on Wednesday began flooding lands at success on the east coast of Demerara in an attempt to relocate hundreds of squatters that have been occupying lands in the area. Gaisuku is planning to cultivate the land to revitalize the sugar industry. The squatters continue to ask the government to have compassion with them as they have no place to go and because of the COVID-19 pandemic, they have no jobs. Because of the flood, a number of persons had to leave their homes and have been camping out along the roadside. We spoke with a few squatters in the area who said that they are willing to pay for the lands, but the government just needs to give them some time. My husband died like 10 years ago. I have six children and I'm a grandmother too with two grandchildren. We both all live here. I come a squat here since January. I didn't come a squat just so I heard about the squatting that is legal with housing. Since like last week, I heard about the flooding. Well, I have churn, I have nowhere to go. This is a very dangerous environment. Nobody never come, no authority in position never come and seek for so well. We can do something about the situation. You understand? But when people need Guyanese support, they come out. When Guyanese need them, they stay in. You can't just come and flood with people living, with children and do things to people like this. He really hard on his young children. He tired and we were so big. What is this young children? I'm really feeling bad about it. Me and I know if I live. Your home was flooded too? No, I live down on the back there from yesterday. Now I'm going back home. I call my son and tell me two Charlie working and they're flooding the place. This was going on here is total lawlessness on the government of Guyana. I have nothing against the government. I'm an ex-military. Look this here. Is this a better life for all Guyanese? I want the world to see. This government is trying to satisfy 7,000 sugar workers and killing 10,000 squatters. Is success is the only squatting settlement in this country? No. So why only success people getting this type of treatment? Everybody here, squatters, we want Irfan Ali and Kranico to come in to, to solve this problem. No, 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 we want you to come. The government has said that it will fast track housing applications for the squatters, but the squatters are claiming that they have invested too much to relocate at this time. Residents living in the area have also called for the immediate removal of the squatters, saying that they are involved in illegal activities and have been terrorizing and robbing them. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Esanela Patvo. And in a Facebook post where she said she didn't want to work a single day with the People's Progressive Party and upheld her affiliation to the APNU AFC coalition, former magistrate Don Cush announced that her contract as director of the Competition and Consumer Affairs Commission was terminated. In the letter posted on Kush's Facebook page and signed by the new chairman of the commission, Ms. Dolly Subdio, Kush's services as director were terminated with immediate effect. Kush said she will, quote-unquote, not go hungry. No reason was given for the move, but the letter stated that she will be receiving one month's salary in lieu of notice and other allowances. Kush in the post said she never wanted to work a day under the PVP administration, but had colleagues who encouraged her to remain. She said no reason was given for her termination, but she said it carries the stench of political victimization. When the newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sport. Stay tuned. series they selected it say uh, the chief selector Roger Harper said said that uh, all players are available and that would mean that uh, Darren Bravo, Shimon Hetmai and Kimo Paul would be available for the test aspect of that series. Whether or not they're accepting an invitation to tour is another story but if those three players are in which means that you'd have to make some changes to that test squad that went to England the 15-man squad and of course the reserve list of 10 that went to England would be chopped to five so some changes would have to be made. Based on what took place in England, Akeem, uh, West Indies losing that series 1-2. If those three players come back, how do you see they fitting, them fitting into that 15-man that, that, um, squad? Uh, basically, I think Rifa would, would, would be a fall guy here in Kuma Bonner and uh, Shea Hope. 
uh, I think those three would be the automatic fall guys for those three players. I would be on the assumption that given that Mr. Harper would have was stated that they were in line for the the test squad, that they yeah. would come come uh, I guess swap for those three players into the I guess the 15 man squad. Uh, that is basically I know for some reason John Campbell gets another life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it could be a case where both Shea Hope and John Campbell are dropped. Uh, yeah. Let's be honest, you know, both uh, 16, 17 average in that series, neither have been in, in any prolific form for the longest period of time. And uh, it could be a case where the selectors take a decision to, to ask both and, and bring in fresh faces to partner someone fresh with Craig Barfit. So that could that, that could mean that Shane Mosey could actually be in line for uh, uh, that opening position. Or I guess the favorite talk from a lot of the pundits around the fraternity is giving Josh and Silva that option. So it, it, it's it's a toss up that even four persons out of that squad could be out. And, yeah. and there's some a fresh face coming into the 50 man squad. There is a team tour as well. So that, 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 would, that would give a, a bit of a luxury in terms of even if the likes of John Campbell and Shea Hope are dropped. They could be placed in the A team squad, you know, to just uh, as a more booster and be able to at least they're playing cricket ahead of future tours. Yeah, and there's a possibility that all those players that went to England because of the A team tour could be heading to New Zealand as well. I like the like I like the, the idea of, of Joshua De Silva. He made runs in um, in England in those practice matches. So that is an option for West Indies going forward. But two test matches, three to twenties. Uh, West Indies playing New Zealand uh, is always a tough place for West Indies to tour. They have not done well in New Zealand. How do you see them going finally, Akeem, in the series um, playing the New Zealand's, the Black Caps at home? Look, based on, on all the information that, that have been put out about the tour, it's going to be less, I guess, less under control as they were, you know, less confinement as they were in England. In so England, they yeah. spent two weeks in quarantine and then they're free to, quote unquote, roam. You know, they're free yeah. to do what. You know enjoy themselves as in previous series obviously they're going to still be some restrictions but they don't have that full lockdown that they would have been endured in england where they complained about it's a shorter series as well so i'm thinking that they, they, they could do far better than they did in england they could come away at least i'm i'm giving them the 20 series i'm you know let, let's not talk about that wesley should win this series yes history shows that they have been poor in new zealand yeah. and they're actually ninth in new zealand or sixth in the rankings They've only won one from eight in New Zealand, you know. But I believe if you go with a full strength West Indies team to New Zealand right now, given the fact that that full strength team would have been playing in the CPL and then in the IPL, they have good enough match practice and they could defeat New Zealand in the 20 series. The test series, however, is the more complicated part. I believe that they, they, they can come away with a, with a good vic with, with a series victory or at least a one all, you know, a one all draw. They can win a match in New Zealand. I believe that. Based on how they started in the England series, it, it, it shows good promise. But I guess the, as the players stated, after the confinement and everything got to their head and they just really you know, lost it. But they're going to have to bat well. I think yeah. at the end of the day, we could talk here, Arvin, I should say all we want about them and which players should come in and not. But if West Indies don't bat well, they're not going to win the series. You know, they have to find ways of putting up 600 runs in the test, you know, 300 runs, eight innings. And if they can't do that, they're not going to win. That, that is simple. If they can't produce runs, if persons aren't going to be scoring centuries, you know, they're not going to win any test match in New Zealand. Yeah, and, and they have to be consistent. And um, they have been winning test matches, but not been able to close out series. So that is important going forward. They need to win the, the, the crucial moments and, of course, bat well. That has been the West Indies bugbear over the last uh, couple of years. Thank you for your thoughts, Akeem. We'll await the selectors who would uh, produce those squads for New Zealand later this week. In addition to the, the artificial surface facility that we hope to develop, we also discussed with the minister ideas of getting the sport back into schools, the possibility of having ministry-attached personnel who can supervise at the PE teacher level, you know, training sessions and, and, and competition within schools. We have gone back in schools recently on a small basis, and that has been a huge success. But we hope that that can be expanded now with a more developed program. 
we also discuss the the upkeep of of our current facilities sports facilities in the city especially um sports hall cliff anderson sports hall and, and the national gymnasium we have been holding international tournaments at those facilities for several years now and they're great facilities but however they they have deteriorated over time and in order to keep ensuring that we hold a quality event at those at those facilities we need to have them you know maintained properly being the lights the plumbing you know and and, and the infrastructure itself so we thought the, the the meeting was very constructive and and well received and we feel optimistic and look forward to further discussion and and and, and producing results As of October 14, Guyana's confirmed cases of COVID-19 soared to 3,589, including 16 persons in the COVID-19 intensive care unit. Now, despite the International April's reopening on October 12, the Federation took the decision to end the season since there is no overseas competition. There was the South American powerlifting and bench press equipped and classic championships from December 1st to the 6th in Peru, but the International Federation cancelled that event. The idea was there, however, the International Powerlifting Federation cancelled all of their events. The last event they had on the calendar that would have happened would have been in December, which would have been FISUPO, Raw Nationals and Equip, not Raw Nationals, Raw and Equipped competition for the South American countries. That was also cancelled last Monday. According to White, the Federation considered keeping one event under strict COVID-19 guidelines, but decided against given high risk. The Intermediate Championships in April May, the Royal Nationals in September, and the Seniors in December were the local events affected by the pandemic. It was a consideration, but based on how the cases are um, constantly increasing right now, we just thought it um, to be the best choice, the best option to not keep a competition, even though it would have only been the the athletes, the officials, and the executive members. Because in for us, we thought, okay, we can keep a competition, remove the audience, and you know, still have, you know, the, the strong men and strong women showcase their talent. However, we don't know if any of the athletes or anybody who would have been there would have possibly, you know, been infected with COVID. So we don't want to take that chance. Though attention is turned to 2021, White said the current closure of gyms would suggest that it might not be an early start to the competition season. We're looking forward to novices but even that might be a bit stiff because people don't have access to gyms right now they're closed so it would if anything it more than likely might have to be competitions later in the year which would possibly be intermediate um intermediate raw nationals and senior nationals a total of 17 new records were set at this year's novices the only competition held by the jpf in 2020 According to the International Powerlifting Federation calendar, all 2020 activities are marked cancelled, but those of 2021 are still on the cards. The first one for Guyana's attention would be the South American Powerlifting and Bench Press Equipped and Classic Championships in July. For the newsroom, Akim Green. Thank you.